<laughs> I think I think we're good to start now. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome to you. And today is the second edition of Circular Days webinar. And this edition is hosted by Atlantic Technological University or Erstwhile IT Sligo in Ireland. And um, in the Symbioma project, there are three different strands. And the first one is potato, then we have breweries. The third one is seafood waste. So uh, we are looking at valorization of seafood waste. And today's webinar is being designed um, um, as follows. So we have the agenda here. So after the introduction, um, I am, by the way, uh, Unnikrishnan. I am the research and engagement officer in the project. And uh, uh, after the introduction, we have uh, an overview of uh, the Symbioma journey uh, by Ayaze Ehiman, uh, the project coordinator, which is followed by um, uh, one of our industrial partners. So their experiences with Symbioma and uh, the kind of ways that they have and what work has been done on that. And then to give a uh, perspective about promoting enterprise in, um, in, in the area and in the domain, we have um, Eve Ann uh, uh, from Donegal Leo, um, who is going to talk on enterprise support and funding, um, followed by um, um, a brief about our core research that has been uh, carried out as part of Symbioma and of course followed by um, a discussion and uh, question and answers. So that's all from my end. I would uh, pass the baton to ASA now. Thank you. Here's a, you, so, you, so, sorry, just to let everyone know, just before I start the presentation, that um, the event is actually being re-recorded, so I hope you all don't mind. Uh, it's just for do, um, documentation purposes for the um, project, so we'll be um, very appreciative if you're all, uh, okay with us re-recording the um, session. Um, so, uh, just to give a quick overview of the of the project and the project so far, I am trying to share my screen. I cannot see where that is on the web um, portal. Uh, just give me a second. So used to using the desktop uh, app. Okay, I literally, I literally cannot see it. Uh, um, I want to uh, share the presentation with us. Uh, we could, I could try to share it or something. Yep, um, might just take some time. Okay, seeing it now. Yeah, okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, so can everyone see the presentation now? Yes. Okay, uh, brilliant. So uh, I'll just quickly give an overview of the Symbioma project, um, what the project's about for those of you, you who are uh, coming across this for the first time. So I'll do that quite briefly before I delve into uh, the industry that we're really focused in at um, the ATU. Um, Atlantic Technological University is uh, a name that I am also getting used to using myself. So forgive me if during this presentation, you might hear me mention Institute of Technology or IT Sligo. It's just old, 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 uh, old ways die hard. But um, as, as best as I can, I, I would stick to the ATU. Um, so, um, the Symbioma project, um, it's really, uh, it's a, it's a three-year project which started in 2019. It's um, financed by the EU uh, Northern Ferry and Arctic program. So the project really uh, was uh, was funded to provide micro, small and medium uh, scale en enterprises, especially in the MPA region, with um, innovative services and products that would potentially help in, um, you know, um, revolutionizing uh, the um, circular economy and those industries uh, 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 approaches to it. Because it was actually found out that 
there was a lot of um, waste that was uh, being generated by bio-based industries in those regions. And, um, and in the NPA region, um, the bio-based industry uh, forms a big part of, of the of the um, of of the workforce and um, um, and and activities there. So this project, one the main objective was to actually establish uh, um, uh, a circular economy based um, technology uh, in, uh, in, uh, innovation platform, which I would refer to at the end of this presentation, so that it could help to boost um, innovation in SMEs. But I know we would mention SMEs a lot today, but it's not just restricted to SMEs, but, but as well as uh, as large um, large industries that are op operating in the MPA region. So for those of you who are not too familiar what what the MPA region is, it's those areas marked in green uh, on 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 the map in front of you. So it, it it's the Atlantic facing side of um, Ireland as well as um, Previously, um, in this funding round, it was part of Scotland as, as well and uh, Northern Ireland, apart from Belfast, as well as parts of Norway, Sweden and Finland. Um, so this uh, project, the reach is actually quite wide because we do have partners from almost every uh, NPA region with the lead partner coming from Finland, that's um, Centra. And we also have partners in Norway and in Sweden, that's Nebio and um, LTU. So we do have a very good spread across the um, the MPA region, and we hope that with the mix of you know technology and and research partners, as well as SMEs being embedded in the project and business support organisations, that would be able to translate what we what the intended objectives are to practice. So. Um, for the, the, the for the project, like I mentioned before, we did we did um, even as at the proposal writing stage, we did identify that the food and beverage industry is in the MPA region is quite an important bedrock uh, to the economic activities, not just economic as well as uh, societal activities of those regions. So we chose those as the pilot basis for the project act activities, and. Looking at the uh, at the main um, food and beverage uh, bio-based industries in the region, the project actually went for uh, three main uh, industry types, uh, the potato industry, uh, the seafood industry, as well as the brewery in industry, because we found out that these uh, industry um, groups were the dominated the NPA region. So for those of you who were fortunate to join us um, yesterday, um, you did hear from our partners who were looking at the, the, the uh, potato side of things. So today we should would move a bit slowly into the seafood industry aspects. And that's, um, and that's um, where IT Sligo has come to play because we divided uh, the industrial sectors. So we've got Norway really focused on the potato industry uh, Ireland uh, focused on the on the seafood industry, and um, Finland focused on the brewing industry. So that's why we are um, uh, putting for this um, webinar today. So um, a brief look at the the the, the seafood um, and fisheries industry in the EU. Um, it is a very it is a very important uh, economic. Um, sector um, with the EU being the, the third largest producer of fish in the world uh, the fishery industry employs at about 160,000 uh, people directly uh, as at 2019 which actually means that when you look at the, se the secondary and the, the tertiary em employment generated from the industry um, it's going to be a whole lot more uh, the a compound uh, uh, effect of this industry so it is a, a it is a very a substantial industry um, uh, uh, in the EU, with the a total um, market value being worth about 93.4 uh, billion euros. Uh, this was as at uh, 2020. Uh, 2020, uh, 2020. Um, although there was a small de de decline in the market values last year uh, of about 1.2%, uh, this is still expected um, to grow in the next um, five years um, 
at an average value of about 2.2 per, 2.2 percent because it's expected that you know with with changing uh, diets as well as you know growing population globally that um, the um, in the the industry should benefit from that. The the total production um, in the uh, in the EU uh, is over five um, a million tons um, um, live live weight and uh, but the 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 EU industry is not just um, self-sufficient in the sense that it actually Im imports quite a bit as well. In fact, it imports more than it um, that than, than it produces uh, because there's a, 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 a sufficiency ratio of about 45 per cent. So that means that um, the EU only only consumes about uh, that amount which is produced. So it, it does import about 9.4 um, uh, million tons live weight. Mean that the entire so apply um, in the EU um, marketplace is about 14.5 million. Now, some of this is still re-exported out as you know food products or in in um, other in 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 other products that are produced in the EU. But that now means that there is a there is a there is a wealth of um, raw, 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 raw materials that are being processed in uh, in the EU, which um, which is of note, especially for this project. Um, the the beauty of the seafood industry, unlike say the potato industry, for those of, of, of you who joined us yesterday, is that it is not it is not um, it is it is quite varied in its in its very nature. Um, so and that was a problem for us when we started the the project because uh, the classification of seafood types um, it is actually quite varied. And in fact, even when you're just talking about fin fish, and that is fish like you and I would know it, it is defined in different ways by different countries. So you might have um, it uh, known as per, 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 uh, per allergic fish or the mass of fish or freshwater fish or flat fish. And then you also, the, the scope that we're looking at at, at ATU also covered um, your crustaceans, you know, like your, your shrimps, uh, your crabs, uh, as well as it covered your mollusks. So your mollusks, uh, your your bivalves, your your oysters, and your um, um, thinking of another mollusk that might be very common. I just yeah, I just like oysters, so that is what comes to mind first. Um, your scallops, yeah. Um, so um, things like that all all fall under the seafood sector. So. Um, to show you to show you how varied it is, um, so we've just got a, t a table here looking at the different um, um, commodity uh, groups um, that are produced in in the EU. Uh, so most of them are actually uh, farmed, and uh, most of the EU produce uh, produce is farmed, and um, and there's a, a fair amount also ob obtained from the um, wild. And from all of this, so you always have your 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 import and export as, as well. So for the EU, um, seafood production is mainly dominated by um, uh, fish, uh, uh, with the fish uh, pro fish production accounting for over sixty percent of uh, total uh, EU um, um, content. With um, your other fresh water, and that this is really. Um, so water fish with your fresh water fish as well as um, your crustaceans and your mollusks actually are accounting for less than 15 percent of total EU um, content. So um, with the, the variation that we've got in the different commodity groups, so we decided to quite to simplify it quite a bit um, at um, for our research and for our focus in reaching out to um, um, the intended uh, target stakeholders. Uh, stake, stake, stake so we did end up concentrating in just three main groups: um, fish, um, uh, that's all fish types, as well as crustaceans and mollusks. So um, the fish could be um, concentrating on the main fish types that were being farmed or being fished in uh, in Ireland. So like your salmon and and uh, other popular fish like that. Uh, crustacean, um, especially we're really focused on crabs and shrimps. 
as well as uh, mullets, where we're really looking at uh, oysters and looking out, out for industries that are focused on these groups. So um, the presentation going forward would really be looking at those um, industry groups types, uh, group types of fish, your crustaceans and your mollusks. And the presentations that you would get after this would really be reflecting on those on on those groups um, that um, that I just mentioned. Um, so um, going forward, um, we concentrated a bit on the Irish co context. Uh, the seafood industry is actually quite important, especially for the NPA region where we reside. Um, I don't need to even um, beat that drum a bit too much because uh, the NPA region is really um, just, uh, you know, by the side of the Atlantic and the seafood industry by that very nature is one is a very important um, um, sectoral um, group there. Uh, so uh, it being next to the Atlantic, uh, that's um, and with us being the Atlantic Technological University, it only makes sense that we'll be focused on on fish. So the total, um, the, the, with the amount of fish that is being generated in the Irish context, means that there's actually quite a fair amount of waste. Um, being generated as well. So this now provides an opportunity for us to do some work. So uh, what we've we've got there are uh, approximate figures of uh, the, the total uh, amount of um, fish that is being landed. So when we say landing, it means that the amount of available um, um, quantities that uh, that that's that come into either for processing or goes to market directly as whole fish, or that ends up, you know, say, take for instance, in the pet food industry. So that's the total planting. And then the waste generated from it, uh, like the off cuts and the, the scales, the skins, the, the fins that are not consumed and currently do not have a, a ready market. So as we can see with the fish, there's about 35% of it with the guts and all of that, that end, ends up as waste. And with the mollusks is actually slightly larger uh, at 40%. But these are all, these are all very uh, generalized approximates because when we start to narrow in on, on an industry and uh, on, um, on an industry and a specific species um, processing, we tend to find out that the um, that the waste arising from those uh, processing could be a whole lot more. So take for instance, like in the, the mollusk um, uh, industry with oysters, um, you could actually get um, waste wastes uh, being produced um, over over seventy percent of the, the total um, live weight of the uh, product. So that provides really um, a problem that has got to be ad addressed. And sometimes when we're talking about uh, landing and, and waste, it's not even just as simple uh, as simple as that. It's not just so you catch a fish and you get it. Sometimes you do in some of these industrial sectors, um, in, in these industries, you do have um, a, pr a problem sometimes with um, with uh, the with uh, the uh, the diseases, especially for example with the oyster industry where. Um, seasonally, there's a there are cycles of three three to five years where you could have diseases, and then you have high high mortality rates. Where even the the parts of the oysters that normally would have been consumed are no longer consumed, and then you know we have to find ways to deal with those wastes. So that's really the basis for uh, the actions that are being carried out at the ATU because we have actually identified that you know the, the waste arising from these um, sectors provides an ample opportunity for us to work very closely with the Irish, not just the Irish, as, as well as the MPA um, seafood uh, industry um, partners to look at and not just to identify, but to potentially um, demonstrate um, valor valorization routes that could be in, uh, impl impl implemented in place that would help them in adding some value to an otherwise um, um, low value product that could have been dumped. Um, so for for the product lifetime, um, would actually we're actually working quite closely with uh, some Irish seafood industries. So I just listed a few there, like Donegal Aquaculture Limited, which is a partner on the project. 
um, they do mainly with uh, oysters and ocean knowledge, as well as the Ibuna uh, uh, Air School, who you'll be hearing from about their experiences um, before the end of this presentation. So um, I hope you have a nice, um, you have a nice um, listen uh, to all the presentations that are taking place, because apart from all of this, we would also be hearing from one of our researchers on on potential uh, uh, in, uh, 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 innovations that have been carried out at ATU that could help um, address some real life problems that that is, that is taking place with one one of our uh, uh, industrial partners. So just before I, I go, and uh, I think I might mention it at the end of the presentation again, uh, we as part of the pro project we're developing. Uh, uh, a technology uh, uh, innovation platform. So the website is sinbioma.eu. So we really encourage that after the webinar and later on uh, for those SMEs who are taking part in this um, webinar, please feel free to go in there and find out a bit more about the services that are offered, as well as get um, some um, knowledge that have been you know put forward there on you know what is going on in your industry areas, especially if you're taking part in one of these three industry groups that the project's working in, as well as getting support and guidance on how to self-assess your industry and how to move forward, especially with regards um, the circular economy. So yeah, thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Um, hi, Hansen. Before you, before you stop sharing, uh, could yeah. you take a quick question from Mel? There, there is a question for you in the chat. Okay. I may have misheard you. He has it. Oh yes, yes. Um, in uh, EU, uh, uh, on the whole, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I think I'm. I missed that. I think uh, most of it is wild. Uh, but the total catch for the total, the total outputs um, for all, um, especially fish types. I think most of it is farmed in the EU. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I think all for the, the total pro production, most of it is wild. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. Mm. Thank, thanks a lot, Yesi, for your talk. Um, um, hope you can see the agenda again. And um, uh, the next one in line is experiences with the Symbiomo project, also their own uh, experience in the seafood industry. And uh, I invite um, Ted Brown and John Brown from Deep Hoon ESTO to share their experiences. Are you on, John? Okay. Um, are you are you are you hearing me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are um, shellfish uh, processors in uh, Dingle and County Kerry. For 20 years, we have been uh, recycling our waste into compost. And uh, this was a long, slow process until we got it right. And now we have a very successful product from that. It's done by composting the fish with bark, mixed every day after production. The, um, what we would where well, we would be interested in coming on board with the project in Sligo is where we have now changed over from the brown crab to the spider crab. And that spider crab is on our doorstep here in the peninsula. It's in the next bay up, which is Tree Bay. And an interesting thing there is that from initial research done by Sligo IT, is that it contains a lot, it contains three times the amount of chitin that is in the brown crab, if you can bear with me. And where, where the, uh, this program would help us a lot is maybe rather than composting the, the spider crab, we could extract the chitin because of the amount of chitin that's in it. The chitin in the brown crab is very hard to extract. It's a chemical process. 
And whereas when we compost it, the chitin is still in the shell. And when it's incorporated into the ground, the bacteria activates and they get chitinase out of it. That's the basic, basic what happens in the ground like that. But from the spider crab, we know that it contains more chitin. And now we would look to we would like to look at the process of extracting that chitin. Calcium carbonate would be very low in the in the spider crab, where it is very high in the brown crab. Is that okay? Thank you, Richard. John, if you. Yeah, it's just um, the problems we had with dealing with our waste. Um, initially, when we were processing the crab, it was only the claws that were being processed by the industry. And we turned around and started processing the body for um, meat for hum human consumption also. And then that's when our waste traveled. So we had to handle that. And what we found was that composting the waste was the best way for us to use it. And we also have the veg growers on the peninsula using the soil conditioner for the growing of their veg. Um, that would be it really, what I'd have to put in. John, do you get a payment for that? Uh, not at the moment. It's all research at the moment. OK. Yeah. We're working with um, One Heart Culture, Stoke Connor Fruit and Veg, and there's a neighbour of his doing a master's, Tom Reedy, and the two of them are working with us on uh, getting monitoring the results. What's the, what's interesting is that from the point of view of where the research is being done, in on the peninsula is down in, in an area called the Maharese. The Maharese one time supplied half the carrots and onions in back in the 60s. It, it supplied, you know, it is a tombola, which is kind of a, it's all a sand based area. And it's jutting out into the sea just near Tralee in County Kerry. The interesting thing what happened there was is that going back in the 50s, they had a very successful cooperative down there, St. Brenda's Cooperative, and they produced the onions and the carrots for the market. What happened there was they were, they were bringing the seaweed from the shore on, as a fertilizer for their vegetables. As the um, chemical 10, 10, 20, we call it, as that became available, they stopped bringing up the... Um, they stopped bringing up the seaweed from the shore and started using the chemical. That was fine. I went on, I think, for maybe two years, excellent growth, plenty of vegetables and everything like that. And then it totally collapsed. Totally collapsed completely. They brought in the wire worm, which we call a nematode, and that now has destroyed the whole area down there, and there's very little production going on there. We were approached in, as John said, by a man who had a good interest in what was hap what happened and as there is chitin in the the shell they are now researching five acres down there to see can we bring back that whole area again back with the shell is coming out of the sea a hundred yards from where this fish is being landed and that is ongoing at the moment and that's where the uh, the stigo it and the symbolic project would be a massive help to get involved with that farmer and to to um, to bring that project really it would be a massive undertaking to get that place back again to grow veg or whatever they wanted to grow because as you know in it's very hard it's nearly impossible to get a fertilizer for sand for sandy sandy ground it depletes it goes in like that whereas we have big experience of just growing grass on sand, and there will be mainly pitches and golf greens and sports turf and uh, like that. And so we are, and because of the chitin and the nematode that's causing all the problem down there, it was the first time I was down there and somebody understood that what happened to vegetables down there, it, it was from the, the nematode. Or because of the makeup of the nematode itself and the chitin in the shell, which is activated, it has to be 
one big problem they have with putting it out is that it has to be incubated for it to start the, um, the bacteria to grow and for chitinase to be produced, which will then hopefully that it will eradicate, and I mean eradicate, the, the nematode. On soil tests done on, in Melbeke in Belgium, and there, it was there that we learned how the incubation process is so important for the our our crab shell, our composite crab shell to work. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for the talk as well as the discussion. I'm sure we could do more towards the end. And um, thanks again. The next talk is by Eve Ann McCarran uh, from Donegal Local Enterprise Office. So it's regarding enterprise support and funding sources for uh, companies working in the seafood area. Sorry, um, yeah, if you can share your content. You can all see the slides. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Okay, thank you. I suppose, first of all, my name is Yvonne McCarran. I work with the local enterprise office here in Donegal. And I suppose it's just to give a sense of the supports and services that are there for SMEs. But I'll put a twist on it in terms of from a point of view of the kind of marine sector and examples of some of the clients that we've supported. Um, just personally, I suppose we have been involved with another European project called Sunsay, which is around the circular economy and the agri-food industry. So it's quite similar in its ambitions for, as this project, which is interesting. You know, maybe there's worth our executive speaking to somebody within yourselves. The other piece, the, all right. Sorry, apologies, one more second. And the other piece is just in terms of my own background, I actually came from the seafood industry. So I would have worked for Marine Harvest in Fanet. Um, uh, and, and and again, we would have been a big focus there on kind of um, waste management and, and utilisation of product. Um, just a wee second now, just to move on. So just in terms of the local enterprise office, there's actually 31 of us around the country. So the point is that um, any SME around the country can kind of link in with the local enterprise office. And the key focus for us is um, enterprises with less than 10 employees in terms of financial supports, but there is also other supports that are there. And I'll go through those briefly. We're part of the local authority. Historically, we would have been a standalone entity prior to 2014, and then we were bought in within the local authority. Um, and again, we link back in through Enterprise Ireland. So again, from a, a seafood or a marine um, enterprise uh, perspective, we would work in along with BIM and we would work in along with LEADER and there's other initiatives there that we would be aware of, but we are very much a signpost. And so the LEOs are kind of the first point of contact for anybody starting or growing. And that means regardless of the sector that you're in, um, but we're very much about kind of signposting and being aware of the other supports that are available for enterprises. Um, and the big thing for our regions is an enterprise culture. And ultimately everything that we do is about um, creation of jobs. So it's kind of like everything that we do in terms of funding is about creating jobs in our local economy. Just some of the things that we've been doing, and I'll not spend too much time on these. I'll refer more to them at the end whenever we actually look at some of the companies that we've actually engaged with, and I'll give a bit of perspective there as well. So we spend a lot of time working with owner managers on their actual own capability and skills in terms of own managing and developing the business. And there is more and more of a focus on kind of sustainability and environmental factors, but also on cost management because of the costs of the business are actually, you know, the key challenge. So there's a huge range of things there that we do from start your own business courses all the way through to kind of development programs around the actual scaling and growing the business. A couple of the things that are probably most relevant for this talk is that we have business clusters that are focused on particular sectors. So we have Creative Coast, the Food Coast and the Donegal Engineering Cluster. And I suppose the last two are most relevant in terms of the seafood sector and the kind of associated industries around that as well in terms of what we do. Um, the Food Coast Initiative is very much, um, we would kind of be very familiar with our friends in Dingle in terms of the work that they do. Um, and we would also then have developed a position for Donegal as a food county. And we had a strategy for Donegal. And this is one of the key focus points of that actual strategy is about the development of the seafood sector in Donegal. Like Donegal is one of the most significant kind of producers, both in terms of aquaculture and shellfish. 
but a lot of the times it's commoditized and it's it's you know it's not this consumption locally wouldn't be strong but also a lot of it has kind of been sold internationally and at commodity prices so there was a lot of there was a key focus of that strategy was to focus on the seafood sector and how we can kind of shine a light more on that and getting the producers actually more aware of how to add value and bring that margin back to Donegal as opposed to sending it onto the continent um, and our members can actually seek to be certified and, and, and so many of them do in terms of actually as a mark of origin not quality it's about the origin and the source of where the product comes from um, the other a key initiative is the engineering cluster and this is kind of where it feeds into the marine sector as we would have a strong marine engineering um, infrastructure in terms of companies that are actually feeding in and supporting the actual marine industry um, and we have just re-established an engineering cluster and the importance of this one is that it's actually about looking at um, how they can become more innovative, how they can actually work across the county in order to kind of service the industry, but also look internationally in terms of actually pitching themselves. Um, and again, it's about making that industry more sustainable locally. Um, and again, we tie in with this kind of initiative of the Enterprise Europe Network. I'm not sure if others have heard of it, um, but it is quite an important one from a point of view of it's a free service. It's available to businesses to register a profile. But where it actually becomes relevant is if you register a profile, you can uh, you can highlight if you're looking to seek um, source services or supply and you can also then put yourself in a position that you're actually there to offer services or supply into other European markets. So those are some of the things that we have there that are available to the businesses. They're available in the other Leos. The only ones that are distinct is the two clusters. They're unique to Donegal. The other ones that are probably most relevant to this is mentoring um, where a business can actually get in touch with us and say they have a problem around a particular area um, and we are finding that you know, sustainability and cost management are becoming more and more of a topic and the mentoring service actually facilitates where we put a specialist mentor in for a fixed period of time to deal with a specific problem. Lean for micro, and this is one that is probably very much ties in with what you're talking about here, is about kind of process improvement with a view of mitigating kind of waste and improving the cost um, you know the balance of in terms of the actual improving the pricing that the, the and the margin that the business can actually achieve lean for micro is available where a client will actually get it's the equivalent of almost five thousand euros worth of consultancy support so a lean consultant will actually go in on site review the actual processes of the business and it can be any business from you know um a restaurant, a hotel, all the way through to kind of manufacturing businesses. But the whole idea of Lean is that it reviews the current processes, identifies its areas of waste, and then looks at kind of projects where you can actually um, introduce the kind of Lean mentality of process improvement with a view to kind of improving efficiencies and ultimately making the business um, more profitable. Green for Micro was an initiative launched by the local enterprise offices um, last year. And the objective of this is about the sustainability agenda for SMEs so where a business can actually get up to three days consultancy for someone to actually go in on site and this looks at your waste it looks at your energy usage but it also means then that you can have come up with a plan of action about how you're going to address um, some of those issues and maybe identify sources of funding in order to make um, some improvements in those areas um, and again waste management is one of the key focus points of that as well and utilization of waste in terms of actually advice on that as well um, I suppose granted, I suppose I'll just throw up this slide because this is where the local enterprise offices do have the ability to offer granted, uh, but the grants are very much geared at manufacturing or value added services. So a business has to meet that initial kind of national criteria, but there is funding around feasibility. So where a business has a new idea or a new concept, and we would have seen this um, from some of our marine engineering companies and also some of our kind of seafood processors where they were looking at a new methodology and they were trying to assess um, the viability of that idea. So they exhausted everything else themselves and it was about either developing a market um, prototype and they were able to access up to 15,000 euro at a rate of um, 60 percent funding so they were spending 20 to get the 15. The priming grant is again about businesses that are starting up um, and they can avail of that in terms of actually getting the business up and running and it covers everything from capital expenditure in terms of equipment um, right the way through to kind of employment consultancy and marketing. All of our funding is jobs related so unlike maybe leader programs where you have the capacity to maybe get higher capital um, granted there's no link or correspondence to jobs. The local enterprise office is, is 
geared and all of our criteria is geared towards the creation of jobs. So what we have to do is we evaluate the amount of jobs that are potentially being sustained and created, and then we directly correlate that to the amount of funding that somebody can actually get access to. But the other key thing is the expansion grants. So we have clients that we would have worked with over the last you know, 25 years that would have come in for prime and grants, and then they've come in for subsequent expansion grants as and when it was appropriate at the point of growth that they were developing. The trade and online voucher again was another initiative. Um, it was originally by the Department of Communications, and that was about enabling businesses to trade online because there was an there was identification of a huge amount of business being lost outside of the country that was actually the potential of it actually being serviced by small businesses within the country. And we've seen here um, some of the businesses like there's a butcher's and he's actually doing um, meat packs where he's actually supplying the meat directly to consumers and their home through the utilisation of the trading online voucher and equally we have a seafood company that I'll talk about in a wee minute that is availed of that. The team is a technical assistance for micro exporters and that's where you have a business that has identified a new market or a trade show that they want to go with a view of developing their export sales so that a business can actually, so if you were going to the, you know, this. Uh, European seafood show or you were going to some of those trade shows where you were actually trying to either sell an added value product or open up a new market or explore a new market, you can avail of a two and a half thousand euro uh, grant towards the costs of um, and you get one of those in a calendar year. The other one that's probably very significant when you look at this project in terms of um, research and development, it's an agile fund. So businesses that are, uh, you know, Enterprise Ireland has this fund available for their client base, but also SMEs can apply to get access to Agile funding through their local enterprise office. So they have to fill in an initial expression of interest um, through EA and then it's referred back in through the appropriate Leo. But the key thing here is this is where something is new or distinct. So it's a bit like what um, Ted was talking about, where you have a project that is very unique, unique, that there's not been much research done on it already, and there's no solution really has been resolved or found. Um, a business can apply for up to 150,000 euros of research funding to actually develop that. And we've had it, one of the marine businesses have actually done it here, the marine engineering businesses. Um, I suppose whenever we look at grant aid, it's a, it's not a case of people meet the eligibility criteria and it's there you go, there's your grant. It's, it, everything we do is around job creation and the potential for job creation. So you have to evaluate an application based upon the promoter and their experience and their ability to deliver the environment in which they're trying to create um, the business and develop the business. The idea that they're bringing forward and the reality of that actually becoming something that is of value. So it's the viability of the idea and then the potential jobs. So there's a process of evaluation. People have to come and have a discussion with us locally. We assess if it's the time and is right and if this is the most appropriate source of funding for them. And then we advise them then of the process um, for that. At a local level, there's a local evaluation committee for any grants that are less than um, 50,000 euro. Anything beyond 50,000 euro then has to be referred. We can approve it locally, but it has to go through a second stage of approval through Enterprise Ireland um, uh, nationally. I've highlighted these just from a point of way of they are relevant to any sector um, and they're relevant depending on where you are in the country. But I suppose the ones that are relevant is Microfinance Ireland is there as available source of funding. It was developed by the, the government as a way of um, stimulating startups whenever the banks were saying no. So the idea between Microfinance Ireland was that you could access up to €25,000 of um, funding and it, it was more like a working capital loan. So again, sometimes whenever somebody's looking at a new project of development and they're looking at their complete funding package, Microfinance Ireland, Microfinance Ireland may be one of the streams of funding that people would look to. Um, leader, and again, it's about rural development. Um, the programme, you know, there's a year's extension of the current programme around the country, and it's very well um, subscribed. But again, um, seafood, marine, tourism, all of that would be very well placed um, to access leader funding. Um, and there's good examples of that across the country in terms of um, even um, I think some of the boats that have been actually put in place around the coast recently for tourism. There's actually a training facility for um, rescue in terms of boats has actually been funded just recently. So again, that's marine and seafood sector is kind of very, very um, central to that as well. Enterprise Ireland and Udris Nagelthukta, depending on where you're based and depend on the nature of your business. If you're very much exports focused, 
definitely Enterprise Ireland, but we advise people to come and speak to us first and we'll help to make that introduction. And then Udris, innovation vouchers are available to access um, research and development work through the universities um, or through a third party. It's up to five thousand euro. But the other thing that businesses should think about is you have to be a limited company for that. And it's a limit of five thousand euro and then you can access up to three. The other option of that is a feasibility grant with your local enterprise office where you can access up to fifteen thousand euro at an expenditure of twenty thousand. So that is a route to um, both of those are kind of about innovation and development and BAM. The other key uh, piece of funding that would be there that's relevant to this uh, group is the flags so the fisheries local action groups. And we would have worked with some local groups in Kelly Beggs in, in order to help them to actually access um, that fund and understand and what it was very much around Kelly Beggs and trying to position it not just as an industrial fishing port, but also that it's capitalised on as kind of tourism opportunity there as well. Uh, I'm getting people working together on that. Um, the other kind of things that are there are inter-trade fusion programmes that are looking at um, export development. But again, if anybody has any questions around those, you know, speak to your local enterprise office and they can help direct you or speak to yourselves. This is just a couple of examples of businesses that are marine related. So it's purely seafood, but also then marine related businesses where we've actually been able to support them. Um, and I suppose this is a good example in the sense of it's an engineering business that was predominantly doing service for the big uh, industrial fishing boats. They were also coded welders and would have worked in the renewable energy sector as well in terms of service and those. But the challenge of their business, and I suppose whenever you think about the circular economy, is service business for the marine sector is very, it fluctuates a lot. So the business in terms of its own sustainability was potentially, you know, at risk at times in terms of you'd be very busy and then other times you're not so busy. So the promoter here is a guy called Martin McGuinness and he identified a challenge or an issue while he was on boats in terms of the safety and he actually developed a, a gangway system it's a small foldable gangway system but he's actually patented the um concept in terms of actually how it actually folds and he's also the event so this is the vessel to vessel gangway and then he's also done a pier to vessel and it's the system's quite unique in that it adjusts with the tide so from a point of view of safety and then he's he's also invested um He's researched, he's invested in research and development again, and he's actually built an automated kind of system where it kind of fits in. And there's a, a battery operated system that will bring it up and put it into place as well. He would have availed of a feasibility study with us initially. He then availed of a business expansion grant. He's actually progressed on as an Enterprise Ireland client now, and he accessed Agile funding to help with the research and development of the uh, vessel to vessel gangway system. So again, the other key part of that is he's involved in the Donegal engineering cluster locally, and he also does sub supply to other engineering businesses within the county that would be more geared towards manufacturing of components. So again, just in keeping with that idea of the circular economy and kind of other industries working together in order to create solutions that kind of add value locally. Um, the other one that here is North Cape Seafoods. They are based in uh, Greencastle. Um, Peter McCormick, the promoter, the family has a long history of working and seafood and would have had a processing facility there at the, at the pier for many years. Peter actually was working in the UK and would have been a buyer for one of the retailers in the UK and returned home to um, develop products and he's very much targeting the seafood sector, you know, the Italian shippers across the country and targeting into the UK. And he would have yield of grant aid in terms of actually processing equipment in order to improve process and efficiencies, reduce the loss and the yield from hand filleting and from the process of that. Um, so they're freezing them down and then they're being sold on then. So he was able to avail of grant aid for the actual equipment that he bought and some of the staff that he put in place. And he's continually then looking at ways to um, further process the material in order to add value to his customers as well. So he would have yield grant aid as well. Um, the other one that I'll talk to you about here is Silver Strand Ropes. Um, they are actually based in Moville. Um, again, a family business that would have had a long association with the seafood industry. Um, and one of the brothers is involved in kind of making nets. Silver Strand Ropes would make ropes um, that are particularly for kind of aquaculture and for um, and the other brother is an associated business too as well, where he's actually making the nets and he's invested in innovation product concepts around the process. So both of those businesses would have been granted by ourselves in terms of equipment over the years. Um, he's one of these guys that started the business when he was 17 um, and has grown the business now over the last 25 years, um, employing 
uh, just I think seven people in in Moville. But again, he would have availed of that. He's also availed of Lean for Micro, which is an initiative that looks at your process improvement. And a big piece of investment that he's looking at now is diversifying his markets so that he's um, accessing new kind of growing markets that are outside of the seafood industry, but also kind of like in that renewable energy space as well, where there's a need for rope of the nature that he can build. Um, so the key things for him going forward were about process improvement, investing in the technology that allows him to get information from the machines in terms of yield and production. He also extrudes the um, the actual plastic. So he's buying in the pellets on site rather than buying in the, you know, so it was, he's one of these businesses that was always looking to see how does he bring more of the process internally so that he's mitigating his waste and managing his costs. And he would have been supported through the local enterprise office also. Um, the guys down in De Bruinesh could know these guys, I'm sure. Um, the O'Donnells down in Kelly Beggs, um, they would have a business called Island Seafoods and they developed a range of um, smoked products under the Atlantic Treasures brand. Um, they would, they, they're larger than what our grant aid would allow us to support, but they're very, very much engaged locally in terms of um, the Food Coast Initiative, but also they would have actually established a standalone entity the fish stop. So what they've actually developed is uh, there was never a fish shop in Kelly Beggs for a number of years. People would have come to Kelly Beggs with the expectation that they could buy fish on the pier and they weren't able to. So he actually established um, a fish shop there. So it's kind of bringing back that whole availability of fish at a local level for local consumption. Um, and it's just again kind of that whole circular economy of giving people access to the product rather than it being all the time that it's bulk processed and gone out and he would have availed of trading online vouchers, expert mentoring and also, but they're a business, they're probably an interesting business for this project in the sense of that they've invested quite heavily in a water system where they're actually created a reservoir that's creating energy then that's going back into the plant. Um, they've actually put in a wind turbine again, so they're very much built around kind of self-sufficiency um, and they invested kind of in that over the years. And one of the key things that they would say that's actually attributed to that is that they have think, you know, meetings internally with staff about ideas about how to improve process, make their jobs easier. But it's actually also meeting that green and sustainability um, agenda as well. Um, again, Mulroy Bay Mussels would be a business based um in Mulroy Bay, just down at in Fanad, um, they would have historically been involved in producing mussels and they would have been sold as a kind of commodity into the kind of French market where they were depurated. We, through the Food Coast Initiative, would have organised depuration workshops. We had 45 of the shellfish farmers in here one day. And it was about helping them to understand how could they add value locally in order to make the business more sustainable for them and give them a better return. Um, so uh, Mulroy Bay would be one example of a business that actually did go ahead, put in their own depuration facility locally. Um, but the other key thing that they developed was they had actually engaged with the Food Academy with a view to kind of getting into the retail sector. Unfortunately for that, consumption of mussels isn't that great in Irish consumers in the retail space but what it did actually get them to do was they actually developed a branded position so now they are actually servicing the restaurants locally and nationally and they've actually got distributors now internationally on the basis of their own brand and their own product so again it's just making the whole model uh, more sustainable and giving a better return to them um, and again they on their own process they would have actually invested in materials to improve you know the actual when they're putting the the seeds out onto the bay, how they're at, or not the seeds out onto the bay, but there's naturally seeds occurring in the bay, but the material that they're actually using for the actual ropes, um, how that actually all fits in in terms of, the, and again, they're after, I think they're in origin green as well. Shane Seafood is another example of a local business. Again, we don't, haven't granted them specifically through our granted, um, but Shane Seafood's again, a family business in Kelly Beggs that would have, um, been involved in the seafood industry like John himself would have been on the boats for many years, had a, uh, a fish and chip shop and, and Kelly Beggs has always been kind of working on different ideas. But what he's actually doing is he's um, working on the landing of Irish tuna and then it's actually being processed. I think it's in France, France or Spain because of the way it's actually been processed hasn't been done in the Irish market. Um, 
and he's developed a branded position again for his product on the Irish market, and he's also been able to have a, to be able to position it on with the likes of Amazon as a product and again as a concept. But again, they would have involved themselves with the Food Coast Initiative. They would have also joined export development programs where we're looking at helping those kind of small businesses develop their export presence. So again, the ultimate thing about the circular economy is that you're trying to get them to work locally with their other kind of stakeholders, but also looking to kind of find more attractive markets in order to bring in a, bring in a better return to their business and to Donegal. So for, thank you to um, Paul and those for asking me to speak. And that's my presentation. I'm just going to try and stop sharing. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. I think I've actually, Deborah and Eshka, I think I've met you before in my previous life, maybe. When I used to work on Marine Harvest or at Brussels or something like that, I was the name's familiar. Mm. Can't remember. No, it's many years ago. It's about 17 uh, or 18 years ago. I know I don't look old enough, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Ivan. Um, I've just got a quick question. I'm just asking on behalf of um, people who might be wanting to ask. Um, which regards the um, the the funding streams and different calls, like how what's the periodicity like, and um, what so is it normally most of them are they yearly? Is it twice a year or? The local enterprise office is as is we that's an ongoing. Any of our grants that are available that are available, it's not like BIM's funding calls like flags would normally be only like it, it opens up in November. I know they've just announced new funding. I think Charlie McConnell Logue announced new funding through flags there, I think last week or the week before. So that's that fund is growing. But that's through European funding and that only opens for a period of time and then it'll close. The local enterprise office funding is on available on an ongoing basis. Um, in the sense of we have like a, a monthly cycle so people can come in one month they go through a process of kind of working up an application with ourselves and then it goes to um an evaluation uh, committee the second month we get an annual budget locally so each, lo each local enterprise office would get an annual budget it's very much geared towards um, manufacturing or added value services so even for the likes of de Bruinesque, any primary fish processors they may not be suitable for those funding, but what they might look at is if there's an added value concept or a feasibility. So say a bit like the project where you're looking at, at um, how do you extract the value out of that crab shell in order to make it a more valuable product that you get a better return for. Things like that could be considered under kind of feasibility that have the potential to become an added value product, whereas the actual manufacturing or value the thing I always say is have the conversation and figure out what's most appropriate because if it's not through the local enterprise office, the local enterprise office has the sense of other funds that are available. So BIM would also have, you know, Bordish Gawara would have um, other funding available for any kind of research and development. But that other agile fund, again, is open on an all, you know, it's not a closed, it doesn't close at any point. Um, but it, it has to have a technical assessment in order to actually look and see, you know, the viability of it. So there's a, there's a lot of different options in terms of process improvement, in terms of scaling and growing businesses. Um, and sometimes the best thing is to have a conversation to see how does it fit and what's the most appropriate support in order to help the SME. And again, the local enterprise offices as business advisors, um, that's what we do. We have that initial conversation with people. Um, and then we've also then got the specialist mentors where maybe somebody help needs help to validate or kind of really spend a wee bit of time developing the business plan around it you know that they're actually given thought to it because i know as owner managers you get consumed doing 25 different things in every hour never mind in every day so you'll have somebody on the phone so sometimes having a mentor assigned to you to help you to actually create space to deal with that specific thing um can be the most critical thing lean for micro is probably the other one that i think a lot of owner managers have benefited from somebody's gone in looked at how they're doing it, looked at where their waste is currently, and that can be waste. Whenever you were talking earlier about waste, the things I was thinking most about is water and energy in the seafood sector is that, you know, if, when I would have worked in Fanad, water was a huge, huge, you were using a huge amount of water. You had to then kind of, you know, clean it and put it back out into the system. So there's a lot of other costs that are associated with this sector that maybe some other sectors don't always have. Um, and it's about how you, how do you reduce those costs and reduce the, that waste? But there is, there's a suite of things there and I think there'll be more things. The Green for Micro is one of the things that's currently there, that three-day consultancy. And that is all about sustainability. But to me, sustainability should make 
percent on the bottom line as well. And you know, we see other businesses that have actually done it well, like Linisk, I think is the dairy company in the middle of the country there. He has really made sustainability work, one for his brand and his positioning, but ultimately he said it makes sense on his bottom line. He saves money and he's improving his margin. So it's not just a nice thing to do, it actually makes sense to do. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ivan. Thanks. Thank Uh, I, I, I just have a question. Oh, sorry. There's multiple devices. Yeah, yeah. some noise. Um, I, I just have a question uh, that is about the marine engineering company. So did they have an academic partner with them or did they do their R&D on their own? So is it possible that a company would be able to contribute into a bigger R&D project by utilizing this grant that they would have got as part of this agile innovation funding from the Leo office? The Agile Innovation Funding, they can link in with an academic partner or a research partner, or they can dedicate a resource internally. So the Agile Funding is very much about, um, you know, it has to be around a new process or a new, um, it's either a new process or a new product. So they're looking at something either internally or external to themselves that they want to bring to the market. But the other side of it is they can f uh, link in with an academic partner. The other initiative that has benefited some of our engineering companies is an initiative called Co-Innovate, which is a, you know, it ties between Scotland, Northern Ireland and the South. And as part of Co-Innovate and an innovation project, a business has to have an academic partner as part of that. So, but they have to be in a different jurisdiction. So if there was somebody here, they would have to have a partner either in Northern Ireland or in Scotland. And then like that MMG, um, they're actually working on a Co-Innovate project with a company in the Highlands of Scotland. You know, so but agile to me is one of those areas where SMEs are not capitalizing on that enough. It's last year, I think there was 84 applications um, came into Enterprise Ireland for that funding. 23 of those were coming from the local enterprise offices. So that would tell me the majority of them are coming from the larger companies. But the SMEs are probably not really considering how best they could utilize that. And, and sometimes the problem is, is you don't have a person internally to lead on that. Because as an SME, you're kind of consumed with other things. Um, the other initiative that I know um, MMG have availed of is the Fusion program, and they've got a design engineer in house as a result of that. So they've actually been able to access that through a cross border, and that would be available to the food companies across the country. Fusion or Intertrade is about cross border trade, so with the potential of either trading into Northern Ireland or a company in Northern Ireland trading into the South, so they can access people there and resources. So that you get somebody to lead out on the actual innovation project, give you the headspace that you need to do, and then actually give that job to somebody else to bring it on. Um, so there's a number of things there. Thanks a lot, Dave. Thank you. Um, so um, if there are not any questions at the moment, <clears throat> I would pass on to Sia here, who would who would talk on what is the actual research that we have carried out in the Symbioma project. So. I hand over the baton to you, Zia. Thank you. Uh, let's share my. Does it go through? I cannot see anything. Uh, sorry, it's not. It's not very clear. Can you uh, listen to me first of all? Yeah, yeah. No, now we yeah, can hear you now. Yeah. We can see. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, can you see my screen then? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Let me go through then the actual presentation mode. So, can you see my presentation? So the, the uh, display, or you can see the whole thing. The, the full slide show now. Yeah, that's working. Uh, okay. Great. Um, uh, thank you again. Um, so um, I'm Dr. Jia Chaudhary. Um, I guess uh, you hear me clearly. Is my yeah. voice clear? Yeah, or an echo there? I can hear some echo. Okay, so it's clear to me. Uh, okay, the uh, presentation. Uh, Today I'll be giving is microwave assisted biorefinery process development. 
for crop shell waste valorization. Uh, and uh, I am based at IIT Sligo, which is now Atlantic Technological University. Um, and as a postdoctoral researcher, I took uh, the project uh, as uh, one of the researchers um, to see uh, in that environment. Text. So, is there any noise here? Sorry, again. So in this uh, Symbioma project, um, uh, we have been, uh, as Ihaiza mentioned at the very beginning, uh, we have been looking into the uh, whole horizon of the fish waste uh, 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 valorizations, uh, especially uh, for the small and medium sizes enterprise uh, across the uh, Ireland, northern part of Ireland especially, and, and of course uh, those uh, gain uh, information um, and, and the valorization could be translated into uh, other uh, NPA regions that Symbioma is working on. Uh, so when I was um, uh, took the project, uh, uh, I was uh, trying to reach out the uh, industries, especially the, what I was doing is this, just looking into the BI um, uh, industry list and, and going through to the list and, and, and see exactly what is the scenario. I have to make a confession here that actually I did not have any experience to working on uh, actual uh, biological uh, material before. And, and that means that uh, it, it, it's, it's quite uh, a, a blank sheet when I have started with. And that, that means that I don't have any special fascination to any other industries or, or, or any piece of resource. And, 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 and Symbioma is, is thankfully is great that it gives the full opportunity of looking into the, uh, or the whole broad spectrum of a, any source of valorization. So that means that uh, now I need to uh, pick up a, a interesting piece of resource uh, where uh, that will be also useful to the actual industry uh, and, 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 and interesting as a resource piece. And also uh, it give uh, some uh, real value uh, to the uh, waste valorization process if any industry uh, can uh, work with in, in, in collabor collaboration with. And when uh, I, I have reached out to these industries, I found out that um, well, uh, where the industries is, is the real need in terms of the Irish uh, waste valorization. And uh, through all of this conversation, uh, I understand that, especially talking with uh, Ted Brown and, 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 and John, that um, shellfish waste valorization is uh, one of the dire need in the Ireland. And, uh, then I look into the whole scenario, why uh, it is needed to be done and, and why it is important in, in the Irish perspectives and the world world. So I, I'll be uh, giving a, a brief overview. And, and, and also those who are not familiar with the term uh, biorefinery, uh, it means that um, uh, the way petro refinery industry, they use their uh, raw material they don't waste anything. They they use a full spectrum of their uh, raw material, uh, and they have got actually uh, this hundred years of learning experience. So, so that's very oil uh, defined industries. So, if we could do the same with the biological, obviously, especially for the waste materials, uh, that could be great. So, uh, so that was the idea. Uh, behind uh, this uh, piece of research. And, and of course, I'll, I'll be highlighting uh, why the crop shell also. Uh, one of the fact that uh, in, in the crop processing industry, especially when I, 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 I talk with John Ted and then we realized that actually uh, 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 me and he has also visited actually their the premises and, and, and have seen the, the, the huge stack of the the waste is generated from the crop uh, processing. It's actually 70% of material uh, go to waste. And in some cases, is, uh, um, 
it's actually even could be higher. Uh, so uh, that's the, the one point. And, and another point is that uh, what is the use of this of this waste? So, uh, so uh, currently, uh, on only a few industries trying to valorize the, this waste. Um, uh, thankfully, you have already heard uh, from the deep room that they are uh, using currently those waste uh, as as fertilizer uh, or, or soil conditioner. And, and uh, there is a, some other story behind it is that uh, crops uh, as a filter feeder, they accumulate uh, all sorts of heavy metals uh, during the span of their life. Uh, so uh, if we need to uh, valorize those, those uh, waste, uh, it, 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 it needs to be done systematically. Uh, the, so rather than uh, going to the low value products, maybe you can see, uh, uh, say for example, for the uh, soil applications, uh, currently the way it is being processed, maybe some of this uh, heavy metal can go to the uh, the, the soil so so it needs to be some improvement in there so i'm also working on that aspect uh, but right now i'll be uh, focusing on the uh, especially shell not the gut and uh, so in ireland scenario you've got about 3000 tons of crab waste generation and and uh, and speaking to john i realized that they they process about uh, about 300 tons of uh, crab a year which means that uh, uh, they have got uh, every week uh, a good amount of uh, waste to process. Uh, so that means whatever we do, it has to be at, at, at robust. And uh, otherwise, they get to dispose this and, and disposal uh, cost financial margin and also environmental concern. And, and uh, what we could do about it then uh, in terms of valorization, in terms of money, uh, uh, there, there, is, there is some uh, few uh, information maybe I can share with you that uh, the kiting market is currently 4.2 billion and uh, is growing uh, every year. It's, and it's quite a good growth rates, about 15%. Uh, so, why is we are not doing it here in Ireland? Well, uh, the uh, process and, uh, and reality is not that simple to do it. And there are some existing uh, industrial bottleneck that has to overcome if we want to do valorize uh, uh, shell, uh, especially the craft shell. Uh, and uh, the main problem associated with uh, shell valorization is that uh, if you want to get the chitin out of uh, crab and then of, of course other crustaceans like shrimps, uh, it, it's, it's, it's that the uh, process currently existing um, uh, is strong acid base, and it be, because of it, uh, the environmental burden is is, is way too high uh, and. Uh, there has been in the last 50 years actually a lot of research has been done and 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 and, and what could be alternative to uh, overcome the strong acid base and uh, there are some uh, level scale uh, work has been done and and and, and, and maybe a, a few pilot cases but uh, we don't see any any, any successful business cases uh, uh, so far especially for the crop share. and and one of the reason is that um uh, this craft is is, 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 is is very very tough, and uh, when you do the bio uh, sorry best processing, and and and, and it, it got some other associated problem and uh, crop up. I I'll, I'll discuss this later. Uh, and uh, if we try to avoid uh, acid based process, I mean the chemical process, then there are uh, microbiological and zymatic process uh, are also being used, uh, especially for the uh, pharmaceutical purposes and, and, and other uh, application where we cannot use acid based. And, and, and that means that uh, because of this uh, biological uh, process, it has got a lot of 
control to make such as pH, uh, in, 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 in initial feed stock, everything has to be consistent. And, and, and making that is always difficult. That means that uh, current uh, biologically obtained uh, chitin is almost 10 times more expensive than getting from the acid base. And, and, and not only that, uh, this, uh, because acid base process can can uh, because of the regulation so forth in you is is very restricted uh, that means that uh, most of the the source actually come from uh, india and, and china at the moment and uh, biological and enzymatic process cannot take the market uh, uh, that much uh, internationally because uh, yes the, the the existing process is slow and uh, it costs time and money to do so that means uh, if we like uh, de Bruyne scrap processing, uh, you, you want to develop, that has to be uh, not only tick all those marks, but also uh, it has to be very speedy so that uh, it don't, don't heap up in, 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 in the uh, backyard uh, of the processing plant. And other factor it, it, it must need to mention is that um, in biological enzymatic processes, the Consistency of the process, if you may, maybe that, that that are right, but uh, when the different uh, sorts of crops uh, comes to the plant, and uh, because their biological consistency is different, so uh, that means the, the bark who is feed on it, uh, the the, the, the uh, process again has to be optimized. So this is always a difficult, and and you have to have employ a knowledgeable uh, maybe maybe researcher team in, in the premises, which is not possible for the SMEs, and that can be only, only possible, so maybe as a special uh, in, in industries, but because uh, there is no symbiosis process with the uh, industries and the special business, uh, especially for the cutting industries, uh, development, the link up was not done, and, and because of that, uh, in Ireland, we are depriving of it. So. Um, I was looking into into all those uh, problems and and and, and try to find a best way uh, then uh, we can overcome all those problems I have mentioned and also uh, that can be uh, a viable business case. Uh, so so what uh, factors need to be considered uh, is that uh, if we if you want to do a process. That means uh, rather than the current industries process where they mostly use uh, streams because streams is easy to break down because they've got less calcium carbonate and, and, and maybe in that way they may use the biological and, and enzymatic process it's, it's, uh, and uh, because that there is less jobs to done, of course they, they are slow. Uh, and um, so, Whatever we, we want to do with the capsule uh, chitin valorization, there is uh, almost no information out there uh, who it is done industrially uh, because I believe it is not done. Uh, and, and, and my research also shows that it is not done. So, so, uh, uh, so when I was trying to do a biorefinery concept development, that means uh, I wanted to do uh, this calcium carbonate. Uh, removal in, in, in such a way that I don't use any as strong acid and base and also not being slow. Uh, and, 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 and another 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 problem who is industry faces uh, is the uh, is the is the best react, reaction process in the best reaction process uh, the calcium salt uh, accumulate on the surface of the reactor and that make the process slow. So that means that uh, it is not only the the, the, should I use strong chemical? Should I use biological? Or should I use enzymatic? Enzymatic process. It's not only that. Uh, uh, we need to uh, work out the current existing best processing uh, where the, the salt uh, accumulate on the on the best reactor and and it slows down the process. Uh, I, I I I'll show you in uh, some few slides later that uh, exactly how that's been done and and, and what is the problem. Uh, and, and of course, uh, generate uh, carbon dioxide when you uh, use 
uh, break down the calcium carbonate it, it generates uh, co2 and and, and 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 because of that it actually uh, fumes a lot uh, which means that uh, it, you have to have a, have a very big head space in, in, in any best processing reactor and, and that means it is uh, you cannot process uh, the, the biomass with the full capacity of the reactor uh, so uh, taking all those uh, problems and also because uh, it is not done before something uh, something in the biorefinery way for the corruption uh, i thought let me take the opportunity and, and, and do a uh, schematic design what i can do about it so when i can come up with the idea okay then uh, what i need to do is a, this is a, a kind of a big sketch uh, i shall try to uh, guide you through uh, maybe it will take a bit slow but let's see uh, so uh, when we got the crab shell i mean the the crab waste of course it, it got got into there and and and, and thankfully uh, in a processing industry of the crab shell in the deep room cases uh, and and the other cases we understand that uh, the gut of the crab can easily be removed and uh, the crab shell uh, of course it contains some of the uh, the re remaining substance on the on the shell uh, so the, the uh, calculation i have done from the information is that um, about 40% of the waste is the crab shell and 60% is the is the crab gut but uh, in reality only on the shell itself is about 20% uh, or actually 16% if we do average that means that uh, there is heap of uh, other substance uh, um, other proteins that, that that means perishable biological material in the, in the crab shell um, so almost uh, sorry uh, half of it or, or more than that so that means that uh, if we cannot process straight away from the uh, in, the, in the same day that that means because it, 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 it's, it's given it's normally um, generally is very all uh, this substance is is, is is order and and some people cannot test it and then i myself find this is is is, is, is very strong as smell so that means that um if if we go uh, you know off uh, if we keep somewhere in couple of days it it will be it, it will be very difficult next that the neighbor will ring you you know the, that you know cannot test and cannot leave here so so it, 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 that means that whatever we do we must need to treat treat uh, those those uh, crab waste. Uh, if we want, 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 if we cannot process the same thing same same day, uh, and it is not possible, you know, in the fishing vessels, they they bring a heap of crab shell, crab uh, the, in one day, and that means that uh, practically it is not possible to process all of those in the same day. What I understand from from looking into the SME perspective, because they cannot develop a, a, a big processors uh, like that in the same day so looking into the pretreatment scenario uh, there are a, a lot of um, preservative out there um, and and and, and uh, some are cheaper some are expensive they, 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 on the expensive one and cheaper one they have got their own problem uh, because if you use something cheaper uh, and then uh, at the end of the process you uh, like salt or anything you need to remove that again uh, for, 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 from 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 your product so uh, looking into all of the scenarios so what i was thinking is that if i use something uh, um, any preservative that don't need to be removed even in of the process that can be that can take part later on in the system uh, uh, for doing something so that was the one of the question and the next question was okay after pre, if i if i have a I have a good pre treatment uh, uh, preservative the next thing is that how i do process this uh, material and because i have already mentioned the all this uh, biological uh, 
and chemical process uh, their problems, especially uh, hydrochloric acid uh, normally used in traditional ways. So this, this chlorine is, is another problem, and and you and what about waste at the at the end of the process come up, and, and because. Uh, in the best processing, they use a lot, a lot of water to uh, actually um, uh, rewash because uh, what happens is that in, in the bioreactor when the uh, using a strong acid, even if you want to do process, uh, a lot of uh, uh, fine particulates, the chloride salt come up and that, that, that sodium chloride and, and, and that, that salt again, uh, precipitate back on the top of the shell and and that means it's, it's even the strong hydrochloric acid i i tested it actually in the lab and uh, within a couple of minutes it slows down that means uh, yeah you go you go you go to do either a lot of heating and a lot of heating means that it's, a, it's another kind of uh, uh, reactor problem uh, corrosion and, and 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 so forth of course environmental hazard is there so uh, that means I need to do a processing where uh, the reaction temperature can be kept low and, and also non-chlorinated uh, chemicals uh, uh, because I understand that in, in the, because of the biological process is slow, I, need, I will do something chemically, but that has to be speedy. Uh, so in that perspective, I was thinking about the microwave and, 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 and I'll tell you later why microwave. And, that's the one of the key question here. I was also thinking about uh, the pigment removal from the uh, from the system. Uh, so basically, uh, it, what it means that uh, before I start the process, if I can remove, uh, especially the uh, the carotenoid, which is which is actually three times more expensive than the chitin itself. Is anything uh, hi, Zia. Not to rush you, but um, um, was God just pointing out time? Uh, oh, I understand. Okay, I, I have to practice speed up. Speed up. No, thank you. Uh, so that means that that that, that uh, if we if we collect the pigments uh, of, of of the corruption, that will even uh, give. Uh, Actually, actually, a, a, a good amount of revenue, uh, which can uh, give the industry incentive to, and 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 also also make the business case viable. Uh, and and another another one is that after removing the pigments, that has to be uh, whatever chemical we use, that has to be environmental friendly. So this is the one of the question. And, and, and then whatever base we use, normally people use uh, to remove the protein uh, sodium, uh, sodium hydroxide. And, and that base is also a problem because uh, the, 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 again, that's the chloride salt is make up with, with, the, with the HCL. And, and that means that the, the, this also problem with the, uh, uh, if any kind of fertilizer application or, or anything, and 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 also at, at the end, uh, the 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 chemicals I have talked about for for removing the cell, and 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 that was the question I will be I'll ask, and and also the the product separation. So uh, I'll try to speed up now. As I said, so so I did I, I did the the, the 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 study of the different kind of base acid and salt and. And also, also biological substance. What I found as a preservative is that uh, if that preservative, is all the, the, all, if, if all those chemicals uh, tested, I can see if it is about 50% about, uh, concentrate and uh, even not fully covered the substance, uh, it, it, it doesn't uh, go off. Within even even eight weeks, I test that means two months. Uh, what is good? Uh, but taking all those aspects, I took uh, I decided to do the acetone is is because uh, that acetone can be used uh, to remove the pigment and I and, and also uh, after removing the pigment, acetone can be recovered and the process can be done in the in, in the 40 degree and that's also kind of environmental friendly um, way to do it. Uh, so. Um, uh, 
uh, I have already mentioned some of some some, some of the benefit, and, and I will skip some of some of the some of the, some of the uh, aspects of the micro uh, processing what I have done, and and the, because this is selective and and that heating rate is, is high, actually uh, you will see later. You know, I have uh, processed the material within 15 minutes, uh, while uh, normally it takes. Uh, Four to five hours with using the strongest heat, and then and I, I I did try it uh, myself in the lab. Uh, yes, it it, it takes uh, e even doing a small amount of uh, hundred gram. It takes uh, five six hours if you do a big boss and a big best, and it takes even longer. So uh, there is all the benefits uh, to to. to uh, on, on the micro uh, using it, but you have to have a have a expertise knowledge uh, in which micro which substance and, and and what chemical you will be using. Uh, so uh, uh, I did uh, found out that actually because I I'm not shorting up and lactic acid is the uh, best chemical to use, uh, uh, but because it is not only uh, only here the problem is solved. Uh, we need to know exactly which temperature lactic acid uh, work best in the microbe. So, uh, and, but there is no such uh, instrument or, or device exists that, that that you can test the whole uh, scenario. And for for this reason, I have developed a specific mi microwave uh, detection method. Where I have, uh, I, I can elevate that, elevate the temperature to see how micro, how in the micro lactic acid use, uh, lactic acid behave. So I found that around 80 degree lactic acid uh, give it best performance, and and, and I can even show you later the, the how it's been done. Uh, so even uh, another problem I, I I found is that actually it's been found not only me but many people is that uh, all the micro is great, uh, but uh, you cannot uh, use its best capacity. So for in this example, in, the, in this normal micro, uh, I have only used 20% uh, uh, of its uh, energy uh, totally uh, to, to keep the lactivity at 80 degree. And, and, and why is that? Uh, it's because when, the, when you reach your, your optimum temperature, as the macro as stops because that's what you need to know. That means that the rest of the 80% energy is waste. So uh, how we can use use the most of the energy is that if if we can cool down the systems and and then again heat it up, we can uh, optimally use it. All those you say I did is on 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 only 300 watt. That means this is very uh, low power. Uh, so. Uh, and and still use on only only very small amount of energy, and then I will show you how uh, that 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 was overcome uh, later on. Uh, so here I have developed the whole process now. Uh, what time and and who uh, and in, in who is with the uh, energy and uh, and the rate of uh, chemicals and the uh, and and the reaction processes can be done. As uh, so, uh, I, I have uh, demonstrated that uh, within uh, uh, 25 50 minutes, so it's about one hour. You you you'll get your uh, calcium lactate separated, and 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 and, and the, uh, the the chemicals I have used as as a potassium hydroxide, and that potassium hydroxide uh, so that, that that is only only 10 percent, and that potassium hydroxide uh, can be later on the carbon dioxide was being generated. Uh, that that has been used into the protein hydrolyzate that reduced to the five percent. That means the, the, on, on the on the a kind of a, a very mild base. Very mild base means that uh, you can say, for example, uh, this uh, after after recovering a protein hydrolyzate, uh, the rest of the uh, materials and 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 the and the liquid you can use straight away to the to, to the soil conditioner uh, because uh, the five percent caustics and and the potassium also a uh, soil nutrient so that helps and i have also also separated the pigment and and also uh, the, the, the 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 chitin was was able to separate lactic acid and lactic acid uh, can be recovered again and again uh, so the whole process uh, is, is is almost uh, uh, no waste there and also is using very very small energy so it is environmental friendly and and and, and, and i have shown uh, it can be done now now the, now the challenge is how it can be done in profitably uh, that means that uh, 
Okay, so I, I will skip those those, those slides. Uh, so so so, so on, the, on the I mean the video. So I, I can see that uh, on the, the left hand side the the, the, the chitin is, is is separated and and is right and it's possible. So I I'll show the whole things now and also from the from the from the raw shell uh, I have I, I have I have. Did, Demonstrated some of some of the some of the very nice features of the of the shell. Even uh, let, let me play with this one. Uh, so so you can see the you can you, you can make the uh, materials uh, the chitin the way you want. You can you can you can use the, the uh, very good quality one. I mean that uh, pigment free and 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 also if you want to have a have a nice material for the especially the the specialty material you can use this substance especially for the tissue engineering or own healing that 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 kind of way who has never been done uh, before but, but we can we can use it so that means that uh, so so this is the this is uh, okay so Again, I, I was I am trying to speed up. So what I did here, uh, I did actually develop a, a, a process in the microbe where I can uh, uh, I, I, I can show that the okay. So so let, let's play it. Uh, is is that uh, I I recirculate the uh, chemicals uh, from the uh, from the collector uh, back to the microwave. Uh, Okay, let it. So, 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 so the chemicals, uh, the, the hot chemicals come back out there, and, and you collected the calcium lactate, and, and then is is go back to the, the the lactic acid back to the system. That means it's recirculate all the problem associated with the build up of the. Uh, chemicals inside, and and I, I mean I mean that that, that calcium salt uh, that that does not happen. Uh, so in that way, uh, you continuously using the system. So now only uh, uh, bottlenecks need to be uh, sort out. Is that using this process, whatever uh, the 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 chemicals we get out uh, and pigments um, the. Uh, base uh, and and also the protein hydrolyzate and 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 then the final calcium lactate. Uh, I, I I I I've shown uh, the different spectrum of uh, chitin can be also also made for a specialty purpose. And uh, now we, we just need to engage with the as with, with more specialty enterprise in in the Ireland or. Or, or maybe elsewhere in the empire region who, who normally um, try to uh, reprocess the buying the chitin from the market and then make the different sorts of material and 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 various specialty material and now we can actually custom made the, uh, the, the 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 substance uh, from the from the single uh, chitin shell or or, or, or all those all this flexibility TC engineering material I have spoken about. Uh, so this is the this is the short of it. Uh, and 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 I have all already mentioned that what can be achieved from this uh, project. And uh, now only aspect is that is scaling up. Uh, so I have worked out uh, in the deep room cases that uh, the, the the amount of uh, shell they generate they need to have a about. Uh, 50 kg bioreactor, uh, sorry, 50 kg microbe reactor. If they want to process within 20 weeks, but if they uh, if the process in you know, the over the span of uh, you know the, the whole 50 weeks a year, so that can be done with a 20 kg 20 kg reactor and 20 kg reactor. Uh, uh, that 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 is possible. Uh, but we need to develop it ourselves. There is nothing in the process exists in the market. Uh, uh, but uh, I have uh, almost a good connection with uh, uh, all the, all those uh, small uh, micro web uh, companies and 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 with good collaboration that that can also be done. Um, so that that that's the conclusion of me. And sorry for the time take up. And uh, I, I hope uh, you uh, get some information from there. And and thanks for uh, all, all the partners who supported us. Uh, thank you very much from the uh, from Atlantic Technological University.
Yeah. Thank you very much, Zia. Um, um, I should apologize for rushing you so quickly. I was just very conscious of time and that some of our participants might be having some other commitments. So we'll just take a quick question from Lampras, um, uh, who has his, his hands up. Um, so if you could just answer that. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yes, uh, thank you, Mohammed. That was really impressive. Uh, just, just to say that I'm also working on the project, but I work at Nibio. I work with what we call industrial organization. So that's the business economic side of things. So again, Mohammed, that was really, really impressive. I have like one plus one question for you. Uh, because okay. Symbioma, what I understand is mostly about SMEs. So I'm, I'm wondering if you have some like economic data for this uh, by refinery process that you propose in terms of value added, uh, economies of scale, economies of scope, uh, the economic efficiency. Uh, the reason I'm asking this is that typically by refineries, uh, they rely on processes that they are a bit stochastic and they can be very expensive. So uh, I'm a little bit concerned how that could fit with the yes. uh, SME. And also following on that on that uh, line of inquiry, if there are also things that we could use um, from the frugal innovation uh, approach, uh, so in, in short, uh, use old established technology, but in new ways and try to see if we can use it a little bit different uh, to make something out of this uh, waste. Uh, for instance, uh, I think fertilizer could be probably much cheaper to make. And for an SME, probably that could be a, like a first step. But again, I, I, I don't really know the, the numbers. Are, are so, you yeah, got more questions? Okay, so I have thought I have I have uh, during the presentation actually I, I was rushing so, so maybe uh, maybe was not able to uh, break down all of your questions. So, so all question you have asked is very valid, and that was the question I have uh, uh, taken on on board when I have started the project. Okay, uh, uh, the first one is that okay is that I mean I'm I'm trying to answer from the last part of your question is that okay why not low value. So low value product already been done by Debrun and they are very successful doing it. And, and, and now the existing process, there are some problems that I have already mentioned. One of that, uh, the, the, because of those, the scraps are filter feeder and, and, and that means that they accumulate a lot of uh, metals. And, uh, and uh, there is one of the case I am right now doing is that Cadmium accumulation in the in the in the in the crop uh, waste. So now I am able to identify uh, how that actually the the metal can be separated. And the only way to 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 to, to cheaper way to do it. There is a lot of way to do it. The cheaper way to do it. Still, you can get the below out of it. You remove those crop guards from the crop shell. That means the 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 way it has been done now as a fertilizer that has to be changed. But why they would be changing it? Because they normally what they are doing now right now they use some carbon sources and and that means they dilute it. Not only deep blue, it's, it's, it's all over the world. That's how they do it. So, but it is like hiding the problems in a way. But you are not addressing to get rid of the problem and also get the maximum benefit out of it. So to get the benefit you want, you have to make a, a spectrum of the product and, and 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 it is not only the business cases also the the you know the resources you have got uh, is you you get the maximum out of it in a, in a circular economic way and, and, and that's what that's what we are for so that's the one of the question answer is that uh, yes the low value could be done and it still is dying and de Bruyne is dying and all other companies is doing it successfully uh, but it's not the end of the story because we need to improve it and the next thing you have mentioned is that or rather than innovating uh, a new way, uh, you know, whole uh, uh, by refinery process, why you are not adapting something uh, exists? Well, uh, I, I have to confess that there is nothing exists as such that can be used. And uh, because if it could be done in Ireland, in the Europe, that could that the people know cutting is very expensive, and that that would have been done it. And, and, and there is no shortcut way to do it to get rid of the environmental problem. Actually, this is the first time uh, I have developed a whole process 
where you got no waste generated at all and all the waste is highly product say for example lactic acid i am using is is uh, in the market is only uh, right now is one euro a ton uh, but the calcium lactate you'll be generating because this has been done uh, in a greener way and, and there is no harsh chemical use in anything like that. You can be used for pharmaceutical purpose, then that is actually 10 times higher price. So the even the, the chemicals you're using at the end, you're getting the 10 times higher price. This one only for, from the chemical. Uh, but then the product, the, the chitin you're getting, you're not using any kind of uh, an environmental friendly way. That means it can be used for pharmaceuticals, other purposes. Normally, the, uh, the, the chitin price is depending on the, uh, on, the, on the environmental level. So uh, most of the companies have a mark and, and, and other what they do, they, they don't tell you where they get it from if they sell it cheaper uh, because there, there, there is not a, any environmental, uh, you know, do, those uh, certification there. So it is sourced for some from, from the east. So yeah, so it is, it is not done. And if you do it very expensive way, and and, and it, it it costs, then you have to you have to you have to sell it a very 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 high end way. So no, sorry, it doesn't exist in, in, in any shortcut way, and it is not done and. Uh, I hope if we, if we can go forward with this one, this, this is the best solution. But if somebody come up before me, we are welcome. Uh, I might have uh, to we'll make a round off now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry for that. Um, I'm actually going to bring the gavel down now. Um, I just want to say a very big thank you to Zia, uh, to uh, I, uh, uh, Ivan, uh, to Ted and John Brown for their contributions today. And um, I know it has actually been a very lively conversation towards the end. Uh, I apologize sincerely for those of you who might have had some other appointments, uh, but I'm very, very appreciative of the fact that you stayed with us to, 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 to the very end. Um, for more information on the TIP or the project, please feel free to check um, symbioma.eu. Um, and um, I know there was some question that I wanted to address, but the person seems to have left uh, the chat now, unfortunately. But, um, so I'm not too sure how we'll communicate. Uh, maybe I'll try and get the contact details from the uh, organizers of the event, um, but, um, uh, David, um, so that we can contact him and reach out to him regarding his questions. But for everyone else, thank you so, so much for being part of this webinar. And uh, we really want to enjoin you to join us for the last part of the webinar series, which is going to be hosted by Centra tomorrow. It's the same time, please. And uh, they're more efficient at keeping time than, and also uh, please uh, join us at nine um, uh, uh, Irish time for the end of that series. So just want to say a very big thank you again for taking your time out this morning and being part of this webinar. We're definitely very grateful. And so we'll be reaching out.